much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session on global value chains and trade and circular economy. My name is Sophie Boutelighier. I'm uh, moderating this session. I work for the Public Waste Agency of the Government of Flanders, and I'm also the chair of the OECD Working Party on Resource Productivity and Waste. I will simply introduce uh, what the aim of this session is and how we will run it. So the aim is to look at the key issues related to global value chains, trade, and circular economy. We will start with a keynote speech by uh, Mr. Shardul Agrawala, and then we will have a panel discussion and a moderated dialogue between the panel and uh, the audience. I will introduce the panelists once they come on stage, but I will now invite Mr. Shardul Agrawala, who is uh, the head of division of the OECD Environment Directorate, to give his keynote speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie, and good morning. Um, what, what I'll be doing uh, in the next 10 minutes or so is essentially trying to put a little bit of structure to the spectrum of issues at the interface of trade and circular economy, and, and then raising some key issues which experts, both from the trade and the circular economy side, as well as from the private sector, would be shedding much more light into. So this talk is not really going to provide you with a whole set of answers, but it's just going to raise some more issues and, and complexities at this interface between trade and circular economy. Um, before I start, I should mention that my talk is based on uh, a small concept note that we've done on the interface of trade and circular economy, which uh, we are releasing here at WCEF and uh, we will be having copies available uh, as you step out of the door. So just coming to the outline of my talk, uh, first I'll be trying to conceptualize some of the linkages between circular economy and trade. Then I'm going to give three concrete examples where trade already intersects with resource efficiency and circular economy. Uh, the first case I'll be discussing is embedded materials in goods. The second case I'll be discussing is uh, trade in waste and scrap. And the third case is quite topical given the events over the last year or so. I'll be briefly talking about plastics. Then I'll be talking about uh, a little bit about what are the impacts of a circular economy transition on trade flows, and then focusing on some key issues with, with regard to specific waste uh, material streams. So first, with regard to waste and secondary materials, and then reuse, remanufacturing, and secondhand goods, and finally conclude towards uh, a mutually supportive trade and circular economy agenda. So coming to how, how could we think about some of the linkages between trade and circular economy? And, and I must say, I'm coming from the OECD Environment Directorate. We are more resource efficiency and circular economy people, not trade experts. And it's just our simple way of thinking in terms of how we could look at the trade nexus. So that is the linear economy, which all of you here are familiar with. So starting with design, procurement, production, logistics, sales, product use and then you come to the end of life and, and, and finally waste. Now, when we start talking about closing the loops, uh, obviously the loop at the most extreme end is recycling, which is taking waste back to the procurement stage. Um, I'm also mentioning echo design policies, which are not really part of closing the loop, but they are a key element of the circular economy package, as well as for resource efficiency. But then we have the higher value loops. So if we go from end of life to the production phase, uh, we, we're talking about activities like refurbishment and remanufacturing. Then we go to an even higher value loop, which is reuse. So we go from the product use phase um, and, uh, and, and, and come back very close to the loop. And then, of course, finally, we remain within the product use phase and, and that's the repair part. 
So these are the various loops, and, and the goal of circular economy policies generally is not just to close the loop, but to go to the highest value loop, so go as much towards the interior as possible. Now, a lot of the discussion on circular economy over the past several years, um, oh, before I, uh, I, I should also mention product service systems, uh, which, which sort of cut through uh, the, the, the whole cycle. But a lot of this discussion on circular economy thus far has been taking place within jurisdictions, so within national boundaries, or in the case of the EU, within the context of, of, of the EU uh, members. Now, if we start thinking of how these loops link to various trade flows, uh, if, if you're talking about the product stage, then uh, we, of course, have trade in secondhand goods. If you're talking about end of life, we have uh, trade in goods for refurbishment and remanufacturing. And then, of course, we are talking about waste. It's, uh, there's trade in waste uh, for recovery. And, and then trade in secondary raw materials. So there are a number of trade flows which are linked to various stages of the circular economy model. Here, I'm just talking about flows outwards, that is exports. But you could also think of imports at various stages of the cycle. So, and, and then, of course, trade and services. Uh, so when we think about the linkages, uh, one way to structure the linkages uh, would be as follows. Uh, one set of linkages is what would be the impact of circular economy policies on these various trade flows and also on uh, trade flows related to primary materials. Um, a, a second set of issues is with regard to specific issues regarding particular material streams, such as trade in secondhand goods, trade in goods for refurbishment, trade in waste, and so on. Then, of course, we're talking about issues related to policy alignment between circular economy and trade policies. So from the circular economy perspective, one big issue is uh, potential fragmentation in regulations and standards if these policies are emerging more or less in a bottom-up fashion in different jurisdictions and what impact that might have on trade. Uh, on the trade side, the issue is uh, whether trade restrictions, for example, might impede the transition to a circular economy. And all that would call for an agenda uh, for international cooperation to ensure that trade and circular economy could be more mutually supportive. So with that brief conceptual introduction, let me just give you three concrete examples where trade intersects with resource efficiency and circular economy. Um, let me start at the extraction end. This is a chart of the evolution of uh, the global material extraction, which most of you must be familiar with. Uh, that goes up to 2009, and, and of course, there are projections on what's going to happen to materials extraction into the future. In fact, right after the side event, we'll be launching uh, OECD's Global Material Resources Outlook, where we, we'll be making projections up to 2060. So that's the picture on what's happened in terms of material extraction. Now, one way to track progress towards resource efficiency has been this indicator of resource productivity or decoupling uh, economic activity and total material use. So this is uh, the figure, if you look at the global level, where GDP is continuing to rise. Material consumption is also rising, maybe at a slightly slower rate. So this is what is called relative decoupling. If you look at the OECD countries, GDP is rising uh, over the last two or three decades. Material consumption domestic material consumption has been relatively flat, and in more recent years, there's been some decline or absolute decoupling. Now, this is when you're looking at domestic material consumption, uh, that is materials consumed uh, within uh, the course of economic activities in a national jurisdiction. Now, another indicator is total material consumption, which includes material embedded in imports. So that is called TMC, and here you have the information on domestic material consumption for OECD as a whole, and then 
OECD America, OECD Asia, Oceania, and OECD Europe. And then you have the corresponding numbers for the total material consumption. And you can see that the total material consumption is uh, significantly larger than the domestic material consumption. And that's due to the materials which are embedded in trade. It's very similar to the embedded carbon story. But so clearly trade flows have uh, an important role here. And one question is whether these trade flows might be leading us to think we are making more progress than might actually be the case. So clearly how to monitor these embedded uh, materials and trade flows is a key part of this agenda if we have to take a harder look at progress on resource efficiency and circular economy. So that's my first example. The second example is looking at trade in waste. And here there is some work that my colleagues in uh, the trade directorate have been doing recently, and they've been trying to get a handle on uh, the, the trade in non-hazardous waste. And uh, you can see, uh, so the first chart is uh, in, in weight, and, and the second chart is in value terms. So trade in waste uh, in 2016 was um, around 240 uh, million tons, and uh, in, in, in terms of value, it was close to $100 billion. That was in 2016, but you can see uh, a few years before that, the value of the trade in waste was a lot higher, due to, probably due to higher commodity prices. So, so trade in waste and scrap has been happening for a long time and is growing in importance. Another aspect of this trade in waste is how interconnected it is. So this is uh, an origin destination map, if you will, on the volume of flows in trade and waste. So you have the originating jurisdiction and the destination. You can see a lot of the trade and waste happens from the EU to other countries within the EU, but then, then you have other destinations like Turkey and China and so on, and then South Asian countries. And on the source end, you have other OECD countries, Switzerland, USA, uh, but, but also the Russian Federation, uh, Canada, Australia, and so on. And, and you can see the destination countries on the other side. So it, it is quite heavily interconnected, and that's the main point I wanted to make uh, with regard to trade and waste. Now, let me come to my third example. Uh, and this is looking at plastics and trade. I'm not talking about uh, the plastics ban, uh, the, the import ban. I'm, I'm talking about something else. Uh, I'm talking about recycling targets and the way they are measured. This is a report by Unomia which came out a few months ago and that was looking at uh, UK data on recycling rates. And it was a fairly technical report, but at the end of one page, uh, they uh, you know, they talk about how the recycling rate is calculated, and at the end it notes, the fact that exporters of plastic packaging are effectively allowed to claim that each ton of material that is exported will be 100% recycled. And, and that's one reason why we might be, uh, you know, in some ways, just because of how we account for recycling rates, we might be thinking we're making a lot more progress because we, we actually don't know what happens once the material is exported. So uh, this is another issue, I think. Of course, uh, trade is there to harness comparative advantage, but how do we ensure that there is environmentally sound management of the recyclable material that is being exported, and, and how do we keep track of it? So this is another issue, which is again at the interface of trade and circular economy. So how to have realistic accounting for the fate of exported secondary materials? That's, that's the bottom line message from this third example. So now, again, I go conceptual, looking at what might be some of the impacts of a circular economy transition on trade flows. So of course, a transition to a circular economy would be a structural change in the economy. It would affect demand for primary materials. It would probably affect demand for secondary materials. And over time, if we make success uh, in, in terms of circularity, then it would decrease waste flows over time. Now, there are some challenges there, of course, but there are also opportunities. There might be new opportunities for trade and services. 
and circular procurement might also drive cross-border trade flows. So if we talk of some other challenges, of course, uh, I think there would be a particular set of challenges with regard to resource-dependent developing countries, which need to shift their economies in terms of infrastructure and labor force. And, and there are quite a few unknowns here, particularly the consequences of digitalization, new business models, and so on. And it's very hard to say one way or the other but maybe the panelists might be able to shed some light on that. Now, I'll briefly discuss two particular waste streams. Uh, first, uh, recycling and waste in secondary materials. So, I mean, you have the comparative advantage story where trade can help boost global recycling rates, um, but the, there are a number of issues. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the definition and classification of waste and, and, and secondary materials. Uh, and the underlying uh, regulatory infrastructure that governs transboundary movements of waste. Um, a, a different issue relates to environmentally sound management of waste, which I mentioned when I gave the plastics example. Then, of course, there's the issue of downcycling and the fragmentation of policies related to circular economy, eco-design, eco-labeling, recyclability standards, and so on, uh, which might be different in different jurisdictions. Coming to reuse, remanufacturing, and secondhand goods, uh, some of the opportunities are promoting reuse of products through exports of secondhand goods, used cars, secondhand textiles, and so on. And, and, and trade can certainly provide opportunities for refurbishment and remanufacturing. What are some of the potential challenges? Now, if you have those products go out of your domestic cycle, there's obviously the concern uh, with regard to leakage from uh, domestic systems like extended producer responsibility schemes, because what happens to the end of life phase and the responsibility of the producers if the good is exported. Um, there's also the issue of lock-in. Uh, secondhand imports might hinder the transition to a circular economy, but also towards uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, for example, when I went to New Zealand, I noticed that there are big market for secondhand cars from Japan. Uh, so when you have cars which might be of a slightly older vintage, uh, you know, of course it makes perfect sense from a trade perspective, and there's demand for those cars in another country, but you might also be locking in to lower energy efficiency in the automobile fleet. So how do you look at the longer term consequences beyond the short term uh, transactional nature of what the comparative advantage is in different markets? And of course, there are huge data limitations. We, we don't have comprehensive data in secondhand goods and goods for refurbishment and remanufacturing. So this is my final slide. Uh, how can we move towards a more supportive agenda between trade and circular economy? Uh, I've already said that trade has tremendous potential to, uh, to, to offer opportunities for a transition via comparative advantage. It's already happening in certain material streams. But of course, a key thing is to avoid trade barriers like import restrictions, export restrictions, uh, tariffs. Um, but benefits through comparative advantage should not be at the expense of environmentally sound management. Now, the circular economy is also taking place right now through a patchwork of regulatory approaches and standards. And there's definitely a need for international harmonization or at least mutual recognition. Um, we also need to be mindful of trade-offs, for example, the lock-in example I gave, and uh, we need to focus not just on circular economy goods, but also services, and what role would circular economy goods and services have in the context of should the negotiations for the environmental goods agreement be restarted. So these are just some thoughts uh, to, to get the discussion going. This is a report which my presentation draws upon, and thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, keynote speech. I will now invite all the panelists to come on stage and briefly introduce them. We have Ms. Jane Korinek, Senior Economist from the OECD Trade and, Envi and Agricultural uh, Directorate. Mr. Scott Vogan from the International Institute Sustainable Development. Mr. Ronald Vogelweed from Glo the Global Sustainability Director from the Whirlpool Corporation. Mr. Michikazu, Kohima, Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. 
And Ms. Takakako Sato, Executive Councillor, Sustainability Management Division from RICO Company. Um, I will invite each of the panelists to give a short initial statement of uh, three minutes. And uh, when you're going over the three minutes, I will flag, but uh, <laughs> I hope you can stick to that. Um, after these initial statements, we will have a, a moderated dialogue with the audience, so then you can ask questions, give comments, also on the keynote speech if you would like. So I will give first the floor to Ms. Jane Korinek, please. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Jane Korinek. I'm a trade um, economist, trade policy analyst. Um, and I would like to speak um, about trade and secondary materials and give a few examples of trade policies that exist in this area. Um, so the examples I will be using are uh, primarily related to metallic waste and scrap. Um, you might have seen in the uh, introductory speech that that is uh, the largest amount of trade, both in terms of value, but also in terms of volume, is in metallic waste and scrap. Um, however, these, uh, uh, these have implications also for trade and other types of uh, secondary materials. So my main point, um, main takeaway from my remarks, is that international trade um, will be necessary going forward uh, to enable decoupling of economic growth and um, natural resource use. And I'd like to um, mention a couple of reasons why trade and secondary materials uh, will be necessary in order to um, attempt to close material, uh, material loops. And one of those is um, also um, indicated in the introductory speech. Um, that trade can bring greater uh, efficiency gains and economies of scale. We know that um, recyclers um, need sufficient scale and reliability of supply, and yet the comparative advantage for such um, recycling facilities does not necessarily exist in all areas where scrap metal um, is collected. And of course, smelters, um, that are necessary to produce metal scrap have high capital costs and require scale operations that um, would not be cost effective in every country. In addition, um, most of uh, the value of trade in metallic scrap, um, over 80%, is in a few materials, uh, aluminum, steel, um, and uh, copper and a few precious metals. And um, as uh, technological advances make it possible or easier to recuperate specialty metals, um, these uh, represent smaller volumes and therefore trade will be even more appropriate and necessary in order to recycle these, these materials in a, in a cost-effective manner. And the second reason that um, uh, trade will uh, really be necessary in order to close material loops is um, due to downcycling. So we know that um, as metals in particular are recycled and recirculated through those circular loops uh, multiple times, um, the, there is a downcycling or downgrading in the quality of the recycled metal. Um, we know that in some OECD countries already, some types of metallic scraps, such as aluminum, um, it, the, the market for these types of, of scrap is already um, uh, is already has already reached the point um, where they uh, it's, it's, it's already a, a saturated market. And so some of these materials are then exported to other regions. We know that 80% uh, of metal uh, waste and scrap exports originate in a few OECD countries in, in Canada, the US, Japan, and the European Union. Um, so I'd just like to talk about one trade policy that impacts trade in uh, metallic waste and scrap, and that is export restrictions. Um, so when we talk about export restrictions, we mean um, 
a number of different trade policy instruments, export bans, uh, quantitative restrictions, export taxes, non-automatic export licensing requirements, and any other trade policy that impacts um, uh, exports in, in, in metallic uh, waste and scrap. Um, and we know that these are very prevalent on these kinds of materials. 38% um, of export restrictions on metals are in fact on metallic waste and scrap. And 40%, um, for example, of traded copper waste and scrap is subjected to an export restriction. And the number on uh, iron and steel, for example, is 20%. Um, and 30% of aluminum waste and scrap is um, subject to an export restriction. And so, of course, export restrictions um, reduce prices um, for these products in country and thereby, and thereby um, lead to lower levels of uh, collection and of recycling. Um, so, of course, um, because of export restrictions, there is less waste and scrap that reaches world markets, and so there is less uh, material available for recycling. So that's one example of um, trade, re uh, trade restrictions or trade policies that impact, um, that have a future uh, potential impact on closing material loops. Um, there are obviously others, and, and um, we can of course get to those in the, in the questions. Thank you, Jane. I will now give the floor to Scott Fogel. I've just set my timer for the three minutes, so, um, so I now have two minutes and 45 seconds. So, so first of all, um, thank you very much to OECD and Ashardul. Um, I think, it was, and, and also for Jane as well. I mean, I think that just sort of thinking about two sort of broad issues. The topic of this session is global value chains, and, and that in itself is, um, is complicated. So the fragmentation of global value chains is, um, is work that OECD has been doing, and then thinking about how this emerging practice around circular economy is to say this is complicated, the data still remains sparse, and, and look forward uh, to OECD and others just mapping out what are the intersections. I wanted to mention three. So the first is when thinking about circular economy, um, Shardul had raised it, um, thinking about implications for developing countries, sort of in two ways. So one is about 30 developing countries, their primary source of GDP is from mining, from the extractive sector of taking out virgin materials, um, both from the iron ore sector, but also increasingly as the engines for the new 21st century economy of cobalt, lithium, and others, um, and how will circular economy affect those terms of trade. And then the second is the ability, which Shardul had raised, the ability of developing countries to be able to safely manage imports of, of waste and other materials. So about 90% of laptops that are discarded and destined for not for recycling go to about three countries, Pakistan, Ghana, and others. And for the workers in those working in those facilities, um, according to one group in London, um, they're, they're because of exposure to carcinogens in, in, um, in, in very sort of basic uh, working, uh, their, their lifespan is about 36, 37 years. So thinking about what does that mean for decent wages, uh, decent um, incomes, and even decent and uh, safe working spaces in developing countries is really an issue, and we, we need to know more. The second is what Shardul mentioned, and that is standards. Uh, we're having now a huge, you know, every single day, we heard colleagues this morning and yesterday from North Korea, from the Netherlands, from Finland, uh, introducing their own domestic standards around packaging, recycling, uh, proximity of waste management to source of generation, et cetera, and, and looking at just putting those standards in a way which is understandable and coherent is, is really important, but even more quickly is what's happening with the private sector in voluntary sustainability standards. And by some count, uh, Jane and I were on a working group of the World Economic Forum. By their count, there's about 600, 650 independent, voluntary, sustainable, uh, sustainability standards. And what does that mean in intersecting and thinking about uh, global value chains and circular economy? And the third I'll end with is the trade 
uh, regime. And I, I think that you know, there's, not, there's low expectations on the ability of the World Trade Organization to address their current uh, agenda. But when you look at the new generation of, of trading, trading um, so TPP, CETA, and others, I mean, they have within those new chapters, environmental goods and services, they have within those chapters procurement, but the other what they have is corporate social responsibility. So what, what does CSR mean from a private sector perspective on addressing their own standards related to circular economy and how can CSR provisions in those trade instruments uh, be used in order to pull this out and accelerate it through trade policy? So thank you. Thank you very much. I will now give the floor to Mr. Ronald Fogelweed. Thank, thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm not a trade expert, um, but I am a global supply chain. And so I think when we talk about global value chains and supply chains that we have at Whirlpool um, is very indicative of lots of large multinationals and, and the complexities in those supply chains when we talk about um, the tier one through tier N type of solution sets. And I'll talk a little bit about where the intersection of some of these policies and trade actually provide either opportunities or, or challenges to that. And I'll, I'll address a few here and we can obviously uh, continue the dialogue as well. Um, I think the biggest one is this issue of the definition of it as waste. And so when we look at um, material users like ourselves and how do we position it, um, we don't necessarily think about the highest utility, not just the highest value, uh, we talked about weight, we talk about value, but we don't talk about the highest utility when we talk about uh, materials and whether it be secondary raw materials, but really even secondary uh, parts or equipment uh, that can be repurposed and not just remanufactured or reused. Uh, as we talked about in the, in the, as was talked about in the early uh, introduction there is you don't want to also burden um, developing countries with uh, inefficient products. If you look at just the appliance industry, new appliances are 50 to almost 75% more efficient just in the last 10 years. So that improvement, and if you look at a refrigerator today uses less than a 60 watt light bulb, and a dishwasher uses less than six liters of water, um, how can you actually advance those and through the different trade and, and, and uh, uh, proper recycling of the existing old, um, old uh, uh, durable goods? And so this is where I think the first one is there's a, sec a sectoral approach. The one size fits all, that it's all waste, it all goes to scrappers, is a misnomer. So how do we really think about life cycle thinking and life cycle uh, analysis and, and hotspot analysis as a way to drive better utility for uh, secondary raw materials? Um, and then providing that with transparency and traceability. So something we just launched as part of the Mather uh, European funded project in Horizon 2020 is full material transparency to our supply base. So we're going to get it to the chemical level, not to the material level. So you have to go down to that material, you know, chemical level to understand the hazardous substances to help alleviate that problem over time because you have to eliminate them in order to actually address it because taking them out, you're still going to have that hazardous material in the end. Um, the other one is we don't think of scrappers as an innovation space. And from a public partner, uh, public-private partnership, I think this is where innovation and how we look at advanced processing, specialized recycling today is, for example, uh, WEEE and, and EU, um, we don't have that flexibility and they're all essentially uh, monopolies that have no incentives to actually improve the efficiency of the system. So how do we actually create those partnerships where we have done in Brazil, where we did our own startup to actually look at repurposing so a refrigerator stainless steel front can become a sink. We take compressor stators and actually make fan motors. Um, so we actually create new products and, and different opportunities, but a lot of times those are actually outlawed by the definition um, and some of the lack of standardization as, as we talked about early on. A classic example for us, we're the, we're the largest supplier uh, by revenue to IKEA, who stands a lot on sustainability. Um, and one of the questions there was, could we get to 100% recycled glass? Um, we did that and every single one of our products failed. And it failed in a sense from the standpoint, not from performance, not from the material, not from the ability to recycle, but from the legacy hazardous materials of arsenic uh, processing and glass. So this is where we have to rethink that as a value chain and really understand what are those transparency, how do we put technology in there, and then solve that leakage problem as well because that actually helps fund the innovation. Um, so with that, I think uh, we have to understand both the legacy issues, how do we actually take the life cycle approach, and then how do we uh, use innovation and technology in 
the, the end stream uh, to do the revaluation and, and purposing uh, for as we, as we get into the global value chain from a, from a policy perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will give the floor to Mr. Mihikazu Kohima. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, I have studied uh, recycling in Asia and uh, Asian countries and also international trade of recyclable waste. Uh, and I visited a lot of recycling and manufacturing facilities in Asia and also second-hand shop, uh, the repair uh, shop and so on. And uh, I feel that uh, there are some good facilities in Asia, uh, even in different countries. And, but uh, also there are some bad, or how to say, the recycling facility which uh, made a kind of pollution issue, cause a pollution, causing pollution. Uh, some of the uh, speakers already talk about the benefit of the uh, international trade of recyclable waste or uh, secondary materials, but uh, we should also uh, put some attention on the uh, negative side of the trade. And uh, recently I made a Japanese book on Recycle to Sekai Keizai. It's a kind of recycling and world economy. I uh, argue about the pros and cons of international trade of recycled waste and also second-hand goods. And uh, I try to emphasize uh, too strict regulation, I mean, uh, too strict trade regulation on recyclable waste or on the second-hand goods uh, kills a kind of a good business. And also too weak uh, trade regulation on recyclable waste and second goods also kills the kind of a, a good uh, recycling business or the second hand business. Uh, uh, we should uh, try to find a good appropriate level of the trade regulation. That is my opinion. Thank you very much. And now I give the floor to Ms. Takako Sato. Hello, everyone. Uh, as a leading provider of imaging equipment, Pico Group set our unique concept of circular economy, so-called Comet Circle concept. Back in 1994, with a view to uh, circular business, uh, which can contribute to uh, realize a sustainable society. And since then, we continue to develop our products and services based on this concept. The Comet Circle concept clearly shows the idea to reduce environmental impact, not only in an area of Rico Group itself as provider and seller, but also in areas of both upper and downstream supply chains as entire product life cycle. To utilize resource, we believe that it is important to repeat reuse and recycling of materials to reduce amount of both newly input materials and generated waste. At the same time, it is also important to take multi-layered approach, such as repairing and updating products for long-time use. If not possible, um, use them as a reused machine. If not possible, use them as components. If not possible, recycle as materials. Um, when companies who operate with multiple manufacturing and sales locations with clients worldwide, there are several challenges to circulate products. For example, in case of product circulation, reusing products within the same geog geographic area is the most efficient way. Because of this, for pre-owned products taken back in EU market, we refurbish or remanufacture them in our EU site and put them back to EU market. On the other hand, in case of plastic material recycle, situation is uh, different. The area where used plastic is collected is the area where products have been used. If our manufacturing site is located in Asia, amount of collected plastics in Asia is not enough to be used in new products. Uh, those are just a few examples. 
uh, difficulty to globally circulate resources typically appears in economic efficiency or environmental impact. In this context, it is important that all stakeholders and players involved have common appreciation and act accordingly for efficient international circulation of resources. RICO is ready to be part of it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for, to all panelists for their initial statements. Um, before asking new questions to the panel, I would like to open up the floor for some questions from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, briefly introduce yourself, ask your question, and if you want to address that question to a specific panelist, please also say that. Um, I see one hand there, yes, over there on the left side. Hello, thank you. My name is Stefan Arditi. I work for the European Environmental Bureau. It's a question for all panelists. It seems that you've spoken about trade, you know? But uh, I would like to hear you on how we can integrate global supply chain, you know? That's, that means that how can we make sure that the circularity spirit is kind of conveyed all along the global supply chain? Thank you. Thank you for this uh, question. I forgot to remind you, you can ask your question in either English or Japanese. There are, uh, there's translation, and here you can see which channel you have to choose. Are there other questions from the audience? Yes, the lady over there, and then sir over there. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> When we start this conference, uh, the team is about the future, uh, how we think go to be the world in 2015. And I, I'm trying to reflect about that question in that specific issue. That means, in some ways, the markets would be different. Uh, for example, uh, it would be very important that the abortion of uh, the quality of the product. Uh, that means some products not be allowed to be traded. Some products will, will be, and in fact have more value, depend of how they are produced. My point and my question to you is how we can accelerate that process. Because uh, uh, markets react to things. Market is in fact not an entity. We create markets. And dependent what kind of governance we put in place, the market um, will be, in fact, to support the circular economy or not. How we can do that? Um, and what, what is missing now? Thank you. Thank you. And then there was a question from the mister over there. And then I will take, we, we will take these three questions to the panel. Thank you. Uh, Maddie Stanislaus, um, to what extent do you think um, data traceability and new digital tools can be applied to reducing some of the regulatory barriers and harmonizing trade with a, a refinement of the regulation? Okay, thank you. These were three questions, I think, uh, addressed to all panelists. Who would like to start uh, and briefly state to which question you are answering? Maybe I'll, I'll start with the big question, which is, again, I mean, the topic of this is global value chains and how do you embed this circular economy within global value chains? I mean, I think we've heard, I mean, I, I sort of think about it in three ways. So, you know, again, the, the five areas that um, Shardul had raised on the trade impacts, but if you think at the front end, what are the drivers? So one, we're seeing it at the domestic level. And, and that there's, a, there's you know, if, you, if I were Whirlpool, I'd be thinking about you know, what is the landscape of domestic coherence or incoherence if I'm operating in 30 countries in that supply chain? So that'd be a first question. And then the second is that companies are doing their own standards. So Tesla now is saying that they will only source uh, materials like cobalt uh, that are responsibly sourced that has some kind of third party certification. And then the third one is just the international agenda. And that gets at this question about what does it look like 30 years from now? 
um, when you know thinking about this topic, um, this concept of circular economy, of the global value chains, kind of Michael Porter from Harvard in 1985 said, thinking about value chains as a system of interconnectivity um, in production. And you think about 1985, that was before the internet, uh, that was before um, looking at e-commerce, it was looking at before AI, ICT. And so, you know, that coincides with the international environmental agenda. So 1985, that definition comes out, 1987, uh, the Vienna Convention that drives uh, uh, banning ozone-depleting substances through the Montreal Protocol. 1990, the IPCC comes out with its first report on climate change. And so when you see now the international environmental agenda, particularly Paris, how that will drive and set caps on, on uh, both on production and consumption, to me those are three examples of how this is drivers. But again, I think the OECD work shows this is really early days even in putting a conceptual framework around how we think about global value chains and their fragmentation. And that's something OECD, WTO, the World Economic Forum are grappling with and, and getting some examples you can scale and replicate. Okay, who else from the panelists would like to respond to these questions? Ron? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great lead in. I think when you talk about integrating into a a global supply chain, the first and foremost is harmonization. When you, when you think about, for us, specifically as an industry, and just in our industry alone, there's 43 different regimes of different uh, take back, EPR, or other extended producer responsibility uh, systems. Not one, I think, is the same. Um, and so how do you, if you think about a global supply chain that is, um, let's say, integrated or um, uh, very interconnected, not only with our industry, but other industries, um, you compound that even further for our supply base or our tiers. Um, and so I think the first and foremost is, I think it ties in, I'll tie in the third question a little bit is, is how do we get at data traceability and disposition of material flows and a better idea of how do we actually understand whether or not it is uh, possible for upcycling or repurposing versus just uh, downcycling. What are the options or opportunities based on the, the classification? So a lot of that classification harmonization has to happen, um, but that has to also happen through a data infrastructure. And I think to that point, those have to follow. You have to have a standard definition before you can standardizely track it. Um, otherwise, and then you have to have the regulatory regimes that actually are consistent, even across industries. And I think this is where I wanted to bring up one issue with, with global supply chains. You know, when Apple did their, their uh, talk at the, one of the other sessions, you know, they listed their suppliers and I picked off at least three to five um, that were on our same large supply uh, chain as well. And so when you think about that complexity and what we want to drive um, from that, we have to think about how all those different tiers actually come together. And so um, we think too vertically about uh, when, we, when we think about these regimes for, for different types of take bucks, we think only about the, the the target we want to get to, not necessarily the outcome we want to produce. And the outcome we want to produce is actually better material utilization, um, better uh, um, global warming, let's say reductions in carbon, but we don't think about that from a life cycle when we think about the regulation. We just set a, an artificial target. And so I think this is where we have to make those um, and we have to be realistic about what those are and then what are the infrastructure investments that with um, both the companies and, and governments and, and other private sector entities can actually do together to actually solve that. Yes, uh, Jane, please. Um, yeah, I just wanted to take up uh, uh, a couple of the points that were just made um, uh, and kind of uh, underline what Scott just said about the fact that we are really at the beginning of this conversation. Um, we know that, uh, and, and, this, and this issue of classification and harmonization and how important that is going to be. Um, in, from the trade policy framework and the trade um, framework that it ex is existing today, um, the trade classification does not, for many goods, uh, m make a difference between used, remanufactured goods and new goods. Neither does it uh, make the difference between, in a lot of cases, waste and scrap of secondary materials. And if we cannot actually differentiate between this, 
we cannot um, monitor and report on actual trade flows. And we also cannot have some kind of harmonized definition um, between countries. So, I mean, at the, we, we are really at the very beginning of this, of this issue. Um, we saw in the introductory um, uh, presentation that trade flows have increased a lot over the last decade or so. Um, I believe that uh, um, trade in, in waste and scrap, for example, in metallic waste and scrap, um, in the past couple of decades has um, been multiplied by about three times. Um, so we're really just getting a handle on this. In terms of trade classification, um, so we use something called the harmonized system. And um, this is something that is um, revised every five years. The last revision was in 2017. And so what will be um, very important is not to um, miss this um, next revision in terms of reclassifying um, used and remanufactured goods and um, waste and scrap. And so, I mean, there are things as the, as the revisions happen and as the, the trade framework changes that we can do to make sure that we will be in a position to actually monitor trade flows and with a view toward harmonization of classifications and of standards. I'd like to respond to the second question, which was about uh, how do we influence the markets in terms of when we are talking about a couple of decades from now. This is actually going to be the core topic of the Global Material Resources Outlook, which we'll be discussing at one o'clock today. But just to give you a bit of a preview and link to your question, uh, of course, markets would react to the signals they're getting now, there are quite a few things that will happen if you look a few decades into the future, which would take markets towards a more resource-efficient future. For example, there's going to be a structural change towards more services in, in, in most economies, and uh, you know, moving away from material-intensive manufacturing. Now, that's good for resource efficiency. Uh, it's also linked to demographic changes. A lot of countries will have aging population. What it means is that instead of investment, you'll have end use consumption or healthcare services and so on. So, so some of those trends would be beneficial automatically, but a lot of things would not be. And how do we drive the markets to move in a certain direction? I think the key thing is markets will react to economic signals. And I mean, the standard economic answer is you have to internalize the externalities and a lot of environmental externalities uh, whether it's environmentally sound management of waste or implications for greenhouse gas emissions and so on, they are not reflected in the price signals that uh, the markets are responding to. So clearly, I mean, uh, better regulation or smarter regulation, but also more monitoring and oversight uh, and, uh, and also the use of economic instruments where possible uh, would, be, would be quite key to that solution. Now, one thing which I briefly mentioned is policies like public procurement, and I think that's a huge topic within the EU context. Public procurement is, uh, in OECD countries, it's one third of government expenditures. It's a huge driver of innovation, and to the extent public procurement policies uh, can be shaped, I think it's already happening in, in the case of low carbon, but it's not happening in the case of more circular products or resource efficient products. So that's a huge lever that governments might have to shape markets and even trade flows. Uh, I, I'd like to answer about the third question on the uh, use of the di digital technology uh, to track the flows. Uh, what, uh, one of the non-governmental organizations in the United States put the GPS devices into the e-waste and uh, drop the e-waste into the kind of recycling box. And they found that some of the e-waste are going to Asian countries. And so they uh, utilize such kind of GPS devices to identify the flow of the uh, e-waste uh, from United States to Asia. 
probably the responsible kind of a waste generator can utilize such kind of a technology also. Uh, if you want to make sure the destination, uh, I mean, uh, uh, recycling factory is uh, a appropriate one, destination of the container is to the good one, uh, you can put some such kind of devices to and uh, trace the uh, flow of the containers. Uh, I, I think definitely we can utilize such kind of technology to ensure that uh, destination is uh, uh, the, the right one. Yeah, thank you very much. と、2番目と 削減するという目標を立てて今の現状ではやはりあの非常にコストの問題、先ほどもあの皆さんから出てきているトレーサビリティ、あの有害物質が入ってないか、そういったものをやっぱり品質管理するためにですね、コストがすごい高くなってしまって、実際あの規制では使
um, challenge to linearity here, because if you consider that the linear model was take, make, and dispose and throw away, China, to a certain extent, was a way for plastics. Uh, they closed that barrier, and within uh, less than a year, the exports of plastic waste from Europe to China went down from 165 kilotons to just 12 in less than a year. Two consequences to that. The plastic waste goes to countries which have even less of an infrastructure to deal with it, so the environmental problem is even greater. And the second one, it piles up in our markets, therefore giving an incentive to redesign and to think about what we put on the market. We can't circulate the wrong things, and we can't push them away either, so maybe there's an opportunity here, and that's a material flow that has been disrupted by one single policy, which could open up opportunities for the circular economy. I just wanted to know if you guys had any thoughts on that. Thank you. Are there other questions? We can take an, a couple of extra ones. Yes, the sir here in front. Hi, I'm from the Singapore Ministry of Environment. I'd like to ask the panel, how long more do you see a trade in secondary materials? How long more will it be for us to see such a trade happening? And what are some things that government can do to accelerate this change? For example, rather than waiting for the WTO or OECD, would it make sense for like-minded countries or regional countries to come together like the P3 and P4 before the TPP? Okay, thank you. Are there other questions from the audience? Okay, we uh, start with these two. Who wants to uh, start with a response? Scott? I'm, I'm happy to start again. But uh, on the China, I mean, I think this is so important, the decision, as our colleague said, uh, in 2018, or January 2018, China notified the WTO of an import ban essentially on a large category, in many categories of waste. So and then we don't know yet what will be the implications. Is that going to be a trade diversion of that waste stream from OECD to other countries that have uh, fewer facilities to handle that waste properly? Or as you've said, will it motivate uh, better recycling at the source um, of the waste, particularly in Europe and in North America, et cetera? And I think it's still too early to tell, but I think that that, to underscore, that, that decision of China I think is historic. Um, and the question will be, what, what will the data show? And that's going to take a while to, from the decision and then the data to catch up. But maybe other people on the panel, if Shardul probably knows. I, I just wanted to come back to one other issue, if I may, and that's this question of procurement. Um, and, uh, and the WTO again, and TPP, and CETA, and others have special provisions around procurement within trade chapters. Uh, in my country, in Canada, three weeks ago at the G7 environment ministers, the government of Canada announced that they were going to set up some, not over, uh, but some bans on, on single-use plastics. And one of the um, important aspects of that decision was said that we will no longer, the government of Canada will no longer enter into procurement uh, with suppliers that did not adhere to that ban on single-use plastics. So that meaning hotels, uh, service food providers and others, and that creates sort of ripple effects within market. So it's not just a hard regulatory approach, but what can procurement do in terms of changing market signals? Okay, sure um, just to follow up on Scott's point, um, I don't have a long-term answer to it, but we tracked some of the data on EU exports of plastic waste right after the ban. And what we saw in the months right after the announcement was it was a 50-50 story. There was a 50% diversion away from China to other countries in South Asia, and 50% was not being exported, uh, so which was stockpiling, uh, but we don't know exactly what was happening to it. Uh, but I think just following media articles after those decisions in, in, in many countries, I think it did spark a much deeper discussion and, and there were, uh, and I'm not talking of specialized media, I'm talking of, uh, you know, normally when you talk of environment, mostly in general media, you just have climate change, but so much discussion of recycling habits and consumer behavior, and I think that discussion is healthy if, if it can help, uh, you know, raise awareness and consciousness about uh, better recycling at home, but also how to ensure environmentally sound management overseas. Um, I 
wanted to uh, get to, um, there was a point which was uh, made in the previous round, which was about uh, ensuring a more stable price for uh, secondary products or secondary materials. Um, we, we looked at, uh, I'm not talking secondary products, I'm talking of secondary materials here. We looked at markets for recycled plastics and uh, there what we found was one of the big challenges was the very high volatility in, uh, in, in, in prices. And it was actually driven partly by the price of oil, but uh, obviously because uh, that's affecting the cost of the primary plastic, but also by the price of cotton, uh, because for textiles, it's often uh, um, um, a, a, a trade-off between uh, when, when cotton is cheap, you use cotton more. And, and so, so there are all these market forces which drive volatility in secondary materials, and in practice, uh, unless you regulate markets, it's very hard to ensure a stable price. That is a big challenge, I think, in the, in, uh, in, in, in the case of many secondary commodities. I, uh, I collected the kind of trade data on the impact of the uh, Chinese regulation uh, on, uh, on the uh, trade uh, I mean, uh, uh, trade flow, change of trade flow. Uh, I found that uh, many of plastic waste are going to uh, Southeast Asia. And actually, there are some kind of uh, problems already uh, observed. Like, uh, uh, there are some illegal import of plastic waste uh, in Thailand or Vietnam. Or in Vietnam, uh, container uh, of some uh, recyclable waste uh, piled up in the port, and no one claimed to uh, take back. And also, uh, in Malaysia also, there are some uh, uh, illegal uh, smuggling of the uh, plastic waste, and uh, uh, they are recycled without any pollution control, so th they try to restrict the kind of uh, uh, import also. So uh, uh, I found that uh, uh, some countries already try to reduce the import or try to uh, put the kind of regulation, temporary or permanently uh, import regulation also in Southeast Asia countries. So I feel that uh, such uh, too strict policies may affect the good recyclers also. Uh, I mean, a good recyclers means they have a pollution control equipment and good environmental management and they also import some recyclable materials, but uh, they cannot also receive such kind of materials if government pr uh, totally prohibits the import of recycled waste. So some of good recyclers may be uh, bankrupt in the future uh, because they are compete with uh, small scale or uh, no or pollution control uh, recyclers. They pollute uh, environment uh, during the recycling process, and they are they have a much uh, how say competitive advantage because they do not have any cost uh, to the uh, they do not have bear any cost for pollution control. So uh, I think uh, we should have a good level of the uh, uh, trade regulation. Otherwise, good recyclers also stop operation in developed countries. So th that is my impression. So we should have a good uh, level of control. I think total pro uh, to total trade regulation. I mean, uh, prohibit the import uh, may not maybe not good for the recycling industry in Southeast Asian countries, uh, but also the uh, totally kind of free trade of uh, uh, no control of the quality of uh, plastic waste may not be good for the uh, environment uh, in the Southeast Asian countries. So we should have a kind of uh, appropriate policy uh, on the trade restriction. あの、
ているということができたのが逆にあの一時あの原材料の方が安くなってあの先ほど言ったようにあのできるだけあの循環させていきたいんですけれどもそういったプラスチックをあの使わなくなってコストが高くなってくるのでメーカーとしては入れにくいという状況になってしまうでそれに対してあの先ほど言ったようにあのあの私はあのささうちの,あのリサイクルセンターを持ってましてそこからあのプラスチックの,あのシュレッディングした材料をやはり中国に引き取ってもらえなくなってで東南アジア経由であのまた韓国に出してそこでペレット化して中国に戻すと。あの中国はペレットにしていただけすればあの受け入れていただけるということでそういう循環が細々と回っているんですけれども逆にあの今はあの中国の企業が日本とかアメリカに進出してでそれで大きなリサイクルあの処理場を作って逆に中国にペレットを持っていくですとかあの逆にあのそ,のそれぞれのローカルでの,あのリサイクルの動きをもっと活発化させていかなければいけないというあの動きがあの少しずつかかってきております。であの我々もあのリサイクルあのセンターを持っているのであのリサイクルの,あのやはりあのグロあのシュレッディングあのそこの,あの小型小さなエリアですねシュレッディングをしてそれでやはりあの適切にあのうまくです、ね、ソーティングできるようなあのリサイクル業っていうものが今あのいろいろな技術開発がされて進んでいってるんですけれどもそういったものが、まあ、これからですねあのインフラのないアジアにですねそういったあの日本とか欧州での技術力がそういったものが東南アジアそれぞれ,それ東南アジアだけではなくてですねローカルにあのリサイクルを進めていくというあの動きがこれから進んでいくし我々もそれをあの期待しております。Thank you, Jane. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on this、um, point about、um, trade agreements, preferential trade agreements, and,、um, and, and agree with the, the, the statement that、um, preferential trade agreements are often used.、Um, today, we have very、um, sophisticated、um, disciplines in some、uh, preferential trade agreements.、Uh, for example, the TPP, Trans Pacific. Um, agreement that、uh, includes lots of chapters that go way beyond、um, just basically border measures. And a lot of this has to do with environmental regulation.、Um, we know that、um, disciplines exist, for example,、um, in areas of trade restrictions, such as export restrictions, for one example,、um, that are not disciplined multilaterally. And so I just wanted to,、um, to、uh, kind of agree with the statement that、um, one way to move forward, especially when we're talking about、um, harmonization, you know, mutual recognition standards,、um, this kind of thing,、um, uh, obviously we need a, some kind of a plurilateral、um, discussion on this. And if, it, if it's not happening multilaterally,、um, trade agreements are often, are often a, a, a good way to start. Sorry to take the floor again. I'd just like to respond to the question from Singapore. What can countries do without waiting for WTO or OECD?、Um, I, I think,、uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but a few years ago, in the context of climate change, Bill Nordhaus, who won the Nobel Prize、uh, this year, came up with the idea of climate clubs, where you have a small group of countries who could move forward on an agenda without waiting for、uh, a larger group to, to, to act. And, and I think it's an open question whether some of these issues of harmonization of standards and so on could be dealt with a smaller group of countries.、Um, I do have one example we've looked at, and that's the North Sea Roundabout that includes the UK, the Netherlands, and、uh, I don't know which other countries.、Uh, I, I do see the UK delegate sitting there. Maybe the Dutch delegate was to a working party was also at the back. I don't want to put them in a spot, but there is、uh, that one example where countries are working together to look at resource flows, the stocks that are, and what kind of issues they need to deal with. So it might be, I think, coalitions of countries, perhaps in close proximity, which have、uh, significant flows of materials who could lead the way. Okay, thank you. Is there another one?、Yes, Scott? I mean, and just really,、um, just really briefly, just to agree that 
I mean, one, <clears throat> one hopes that the trading system is able to take account of the urgency of the last IPCC report of um, how quickly uh, climate-related goods and services are growing, et cetera. But the reality is, and you know, two weeks ago at the WTO Public Forum, the Director General of the WTO said, we're seeing an increasing disconnect between the, the trade rules and the constitution of trade and what's actually happening urgently in markets. So I, I would love for Jane's vision that we could carve out a new, uh, you know, harmon an HS 12-digit code for uh, a group of goods and services that are arising from circular economy. And in an ideal world where, not even an ideal world, a functional world where trade and climate and circular economy could work together, um, that would seem to be a low-hanging fruit. But the reality is, um, this has not happened. I worked on it 20 years ago when I was in the WTO, and here we are, still hoping we're going to get an agreement to the WTO on environmental goods and services. So, um, I, I look at TPP and saying, even within TPP, could you get three countries under the TPP umbrella to say, let's take one good, uh, let's take one recycled electronic goods, and, and carve out a preferential market access agreement within that, and show the world that you can do that and work with Whirlpool and others and say, we can find, and our colleague from WRI is here. So, I mean, we know what the issues are. We know vaguely what the trade flows are. We know what the market value of those trade flows are. And we know what the urgency of what climate tells us. But the reality is the trade system, even though we know the roadmaps to get there, we have still yet to see a breakthrough and, and the world is not able to wait for another 20 years as we've heard just two weeks ago from the ICC, IPCC report. So, uh, and again, I mentioned CETA. So, you, you know, Canada and the European Union have signed this agreement. They have a chapter of environmental goods and services. Uh, they've made commitments to Paris. President Macron said that France would not sign any trade agreements with any country that does not uh, sign up to Paris, so therefore the United States and others. So, so we, we know that the, 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 the foundations are there, but now we need to populate it with some some binding actions. Okay, thank you. Um, we still have time for one last question from the audience to the panelists before going to the kind of wrap up and conclusions of this session. So if there's someone who still has a question to ask, please raise your hand. Yes, there. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kathleen Tellier with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and I actually just have a comment, so hopefully that's okay. It should be quick, um, and it goes back to the discussion on um, the impacts of the China ban and what countries can do or are doing domestically, and I just wanted to share a little bit about the U.S. perspective and what we've been doing. So um, we have done a series of stakeholder outreach actions across the whole, basically, material chain, from manufacturers to uh, some of the um, uh, producers or brands to the recycling industry, the waste industry. And really, there's so much, I have to say the report, that there's so much energy around really trying to look at what we can do domestically. And I, frankly, I think it's an incredible opportunity for advancing the circular economy. Um, and it's really shined a light on the, the shortfalls of our domestic recycling system. So there's been a lot around uh, the collection and, and dealing with contamination in our recycling stream and what we can do around that, about our, our aging uh, uh, materials recovery infrastructure in the U.S. and how we've really fallen behind in updating that. And then secondary markets and really trying to develop those. And so um, still remains to be seen what kind of how we can carry this momentum into action. But I do feel like there is a lot of energy around that, and um, it's, it's, it's very encouraging. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to invite the panelists uh, in if they have something else that they would want to say uh, for this session in like 30 seconds or 45 seconds. And then we move to the, to the wrap up and conclusions. Who wants to go first? Or have you, okay. Maybe just one last comment in picking up on that as well. And I think coming back to the, the question on, on accelerating markets, sometimes actually we have to you actually create the market. And I think this is where 
how we do that and effectively could we do that um, across industry and across uh, governments. I think it's even harder across governments, and I think this is where uh, private entities, along with the, the public in, in certain sectors, could actually accelerate that quite effectively. There's been a couple of false starts. We work with the World Business Council on materials marketplace, some other things um, as well. Um, it's complex, but I think with the new data, let's say infrastructure and, and, and uh, abilities of track, uh, trackability and traceability um, and monitoring, I think that is a possibility and how we do that effectively um, could lead to uh, driving a huge signal. And I think some of the, the voluntary commitments you see made by companies like my colleague here, uh, as well from Rico, I think is we want to do the right thing, but how do we actually create those marketplaces uh, to do that effectively is I think key. And, and a lot of that infrastructure has to be um, let's say, uh, invested and think of it as an investment because that there is really value there. And, and if we can drive that, then that will be self-sustaining. So, appreciate it. Other panelists who would like to say something before we conclude? Uh, um, I visited uh, uh, Retreat Tire Company uh, in Thailand uh, a few months ago, and they said that uh, uh, how say in the country they import a kind of cheap uh, new tires, which are not good for retreading. I mean, uh, the tire is not so good quality, so they have a kind of short of the cores for retread tire like now. So not only the standard for the recyclable or uh, used products or used goods, we should uh, consider about uh, the standard for the new one also, uh, which can be utilized as a kind of a retreading or in manufactured and so on. So uh, I, I just uh, visit such kind of companies and uh, we should take care of the quality of the new products also. That is my, yeah. Yeah. Um. No, I, I mean, I'll just say again that, um, you know, we're seeing now, we'll see it over the next two days here, that there's um, really an explosion of examples of practices around circular economy. And, 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 the, and then the question is, how do you frame those uh, uh, into some kind of an analytic framework? which is then populated with data in order to make broader public policy decisions to support and accelerate the activities underway. So I, I think right now, again, as we heard from the OECD, the data on this is really poor. If you look at the data stream in the Basel Convention alone, um, Basel after 1989, here we are, there's, it's really thinly populated. It's self-reporting by countries, and it's only about 40% of countries that are party to Basel put in a national report which is obligatory under that convention. So, so you know, we know that the problems, and therefore, I think it's really important for OECD and others uh, to say, how do we frame this in a broader way, which is with uh, robust data, in order to help um, make some informed decisions in order to accelerate this? Because, again, we don't have a lot of time. And, um, and so, therefore, I think that, that moving on this urgently is, um, is really, really important. So, so thank you. Okay, um, then we will move on to, um, I would like to invite Ms. Malina Sell from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Finland to uh, do some wrap up and conclusions of this session. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Is this on? Okay, great. So thank you in particular to the OECD for inviting me to come and say a few words here, and thanks to all of our wonderful experts for all of the information you've been shedding and to good questions from the audience here. Um, I'd like to start out with saying that indeed we are at early stages of looking at the trade and circular economy connection. I'm from Finland and we have the first national circular economy plan in the world, and that's only two years ago, so this is the time that we're starting to connect the dots and, <clears throat> and looking at the issue of not only of, of how do we scale up, but what does that upscaling of circular economy at the global 
level then mean for our national plans and, and our economies that what, how do we respond to, to price signals that come through trade and that are mediated through trade. And part of that is really community and creating that dialogue. So I want to take, take all of you back a couple of weeks in time when it, at the WTO, Finland and Costa Rica organized a first panel on trade and circular economy. And that was, that was, I think, useful and unique in bringing just the concept of circular economy to trade policy people for the first time. And now I'm very pleased to be here among circular economy experts talking about trade. So I think this is one of the dialogues that really needs to continue and, and be scaled up in, in different ways. <clears throat> and. Um, here, um, uh, one of my roles is also as a delegate to the Joint Working Party in Trade and, and Environment at the OECD, and I'm happy to say that one of the really buzzing issues at our latest meeting in June was around circular economy and trade. So I think that the, the work that we've been hearing about is definitely work that will continue at the OECD. Um, so just to wrap up, I'd like to focus on a few things. One is definitions, one is standards, one is traceability, one is on supporting global markets, and then unintended effects. Definitions and classification has come up in a really big way among the different speakers here, and the need for better definitions. And I think here I want to go back again to the issue of dialogue and who do we need to continue to be in dialogue with. And uh, <clears throat> there are probably still other organizations that we haven't reached out to yet. So one of them is, is, is maybe the World Customs Organization when we're talking about categories and the every five years that customs classifications are being uh, redefined. And also the interface with the chemicals conventions is very interesting here, and the Basel Convention in particular, when it comes to, to definitions and categorization. Then in terms of standards and mutual recognition schemes, this was probably the biggest topic that we discussed today. And uh, <clears throat> I guess the easiest thing is just to sort of conclude that this is key to finding international standards and also to then, in that way, avoid getting into new technical barriers to trade, which has always been a tension at the WTO and um, kind of the risk of being seen as putting up green barriers to trade as well in countries that want to be very proactive when it comes to circular economy. Then in terms of traceability, I'd like to kind of nurture this idea of us being at a cusp of a new time because of digitalization. And when it comes to traceability, we've been struggling with that for a very long time when it comes to traceability of the full value chain and sourcing of, of virgin raw materials. And of course, that's no different when we look into <coughs> circularity and we look into um, <clears throat> future products and we look into secondary materials. In terms of supporting global markets, there's sort of this sense of um, not exactly optimism when it comes to the WTO, obviously, but we have had mentioned the Environmental Goods Agreement, and you know, I don't think we should give up on that. And in that context, I think it's also interesting to think back to what Shardul was talking about when he talked about OECD countries and sort of the full <laughs> material um, content of consumption. We talk a lot about the footprint of our imports, but another side to that is kind of the handprint of our exports, which can be positive if we are exporting technologies that are beneficial, so circular economy, supportive technologies, energy efficient, resource efficient, um, um, low carbon, et cetera, and, and that shouldn't be forgotten. And here, our FTAs are indeed important also in, in supporting that agenda and public procurement having come up as being one, one key element of that. And then 
Just very briefly, lastly, on unintended consequences, and um, Scott in particular brought up some of the vulnerabilities for developing countries in this context. So you have the winners and losers, and you have countries that are quite um, dependent on resource exports that might be hurt in this situation, and also kind of the lock-in if you become a haven for a lot of secondary goods and, and what can happen with that. Um, another thing that hasn't been discussed here is the potential of the rebound effect and how that might play out if we globally come to the very happy situation of becoming much more resource effective and efficient. Um, and just still on, on the developing country issue, we do have the aid for trade tool which could be used to help developing countries integrate in a positive way into um, global circular economy value chains. So I think we have a lot of work for all of us cut out for the future and I look forward to being part of that. Thank you. Thank you very much and that makes us finish on time, which is very good. I would like to thank the organizers, all the speakers, the audience. We had a very uh, good uh, dialogue on this topic, I think. Thank you also for the um, technical support and the interpretation. I only have one uh, final uh, thing that I have to mention, and that is that there is a networking lunch on the fifth floor, so you're all invited to go there. Thank you very much. <laughs>